Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our EPP literacy proposal webinar for our non-ELA middle and secondary CTE and pre-K-12 programs. Uh, my name is Annie Ansana. I'm the Senior Director of Educator Preparation. I'm joined with my colleagues from the Office of Educator Licensure and Preparation today. I'll um, pause just a moment so they have a, a chance to introduce themselves. Lindsay? Hi, I'm Lindsay Nelson. I'm the EPP Literacy Consultant, and I've joined Annie in supporting the proposal process. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Derline, the Executive Director of the Office of Educator Licensure and Preparation. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Martin Nash here. I work in program approval. Great. Um, so just a couple webinar logistics. We um, really encourage you to have the non-ELA middle secondary CTE and pre-K-12 guidance document and any applicable proposal templates and rubric accessible during the webinar. These uh, are located in the September edition of the EPP update. If you do not have access to these, um, we, you are free to email Lindsay Nelson uh, right now and she'll be able to send that your way. Uh, we also encourage you, if you're not um, a subscriber to our EPP update, that's our monthly newsletter that comes out from our office, we really encourage you to do so. And um, you can go to our department webpage to sign up for that. We're also happy to send you that link. Um, all participants today will be muted, uh, muted upon entry with the webinar and then remain muted throughout the course of the webinar. We have a lot to cover today, um, but we also encourage you, if you do have any questions, to send them via chat uh, to Lindsay during the webinar. You should be able to send that direct message uh, her way. And we will do our best to address questions as they come at the webinar, but of course encourage you if more questions come to you at the end um, to email either one of us and we're happy to uh, answer your questions. So we have three main objectives for our webinar today. Um, the first is to develop or deepen an understanding of the EPP literacy proposal process specific to these endorsements. For some of you that have been familiar with the first, endorse, uh, first proposal process for early elementary and special education, some of the school is familiar for you and some of it will be new. Um, for those of you that are brand new to this process, uh, we're going to do our best to walk you through each one of these steps to give you that um, understanding and knowledge uh, to be able to, to begin that drafting process. Our second objective is to become familiar with the EPP literacy proposal template requirements and rubric criteria. We'll actually walk through each part of the proposal uh, as well as each of the comprehensive questions and look at that rubric criteria to be able to give you just a, a deeper dive into our expectations. And finally, our third objective is to develop or deepen disciplinary literacy knowledge. Um, we know our EPPs across the state um, may already be implementing disciplinary literacy within preparation. In fact, we have pulled a few examples from some of our um, ed prep institutions across the state to support in this work. Um, but we also know that the, there may be a need for um, additional guidance and understanding around this uh, concept and approach of disciplinary literacy knowledge, and we're um, hoping to provide that for you today. So again, we have a rich agenda. We're going to start with just an overview of the literacy proposal process. And we'll talk a bit about that guidelines document and proposal structure. Uh, and then we'll spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about the research within disciplinary literacy and what we've learned about the approach and the practices um, and make a uh, uh, contrast disciplinary literacy with content area literacy on purpose to sort of talk about those distinctions, but also to really talk about how there's an importance of uh, developing both approaches within preparation to support our candidates and supporting students to become literate individuals. We'll also spend uh, quite a bit of time today talking about those comprehensive question, um, the expectations from the rubric. We'll go question by question. We'll provide a lot of guidance and, and research that support um, some, some of the things to think about as you're drafting those responses and, again, talk about the rubric expectations. And we'll conclude our webinar today in talking about the review process and submission process briefly 
but um, that submission process will spend much more time at our October 29th Literacy Network meeting, um, and so that EPPs are familiar with what, that, what those expectations are to submit those proposals once completed. I'll also pause periodically to just see if there are any questions um, throughout different points of the webinar to, to ensure that we're addressing your, your questions. Let's just dive into that EBP literacy proposal process. Just a bit of context about these particular standards. Uh, our EPP literacy standards for all endorsements were approved by the State Board of Education in 2017. Um, if you're unfamiliar with where these st standards are located, they're inside our Educator Preparation Policy 5.504. We always provide the link to access the policy because as any revisions that occur and are approved by our state board, they're always uploaded in a new PDF, and so we found that it's better to direct our EPPs directly to the source rather than provide for them the recent PDF uh, policy and standards. Um, also, another shift, so speaking of those standards, our state board recently approved in July of 2018 a very minor change related to these standards where Again, we're shifting from this content area approach to disciplinary literacy, which is really going to be at the core of what we talk about today. And just as a reminder, this is just a one-time proposal process required for all initial licensure, non-ELA middle and secondary, CTE, and pre-K-12 programs. We'll talk about some of the exceptions in these endorsement areas uh, here shortly, which are also outlined on that first page of that guidance document. And again, this process is designed to allow EDPs to think about how their programs are aligning to the EPP literacy standards. Uh, in terms of our timeline for standards implementation, um, all EPPs should now have access to both the guidance document, the proposal templates, and the rubric criteria, and uh, with the expectation that all proposals will be completed and submitted to the department by February 22nd. This is um, in line with the cycle with our uh, instructional leader and our ELA middle and secondary proposals, um, although the due date is about a month off. So we did this intentionally to try and um, uh, ensure that our reviewers are not um, bombarded with, um, with proposals to review and that we're able to manage this review process. Um, in a very organized way. And so um, what, what we'll do is have EPP submit February 22nd, and we'll have these proposals under review almost immediately, and um, be able to provide for EPP's notification of, of the proposals that either meet expectations or need for revision. Um, what this means is if you are familiar with the, the process from the early elementary and special education proposals, you'll um, remember that there is an iterative review process, which means upon delivery of the notification that the proposal either meets expectations or needs revisions, EPPs will also be provided reviewer feedback that will support any revisions that are necessary. So if that notification letter comes out to EPPs that a proposal requires revisions, EPPs will then engage in the uh, revision process using that reviewer feedback and then resubmit to the department their revised proposal um, in May of 2019. Uh, review, reviewers will engage in, a, in a yet another uh, review process and provide feedback and uh, notification again will go out uh, that the proposal has either met expectations or have a need for revisions again. Um, and should those revisions be due a second time, EPPs will submit those um, in July of 2019 with the expectation that all um, uh, EPP standards will be implemented within the fall of 2019. We will tighten up and, and provide um, actual dates in May and July um, as that revision process is underway. So let's talk about the guidelines document and individual proposal structure briefly. Um, again, it's helpful to have that guidance document in front of you. If you're struggling to find it or 
um, currently emailing Lindsay. Um, you can still follow along with the webinar as I provided some screenshots so that you'll be able to follow along. So on the first page of that guidance document, you'll see a list of the endorsements um, that are covered for this particular proposal process. And you can see there are some exceptions. In the gray, um, gray header bands across, you'll see um, for middle and secondary, there is um, a proposal process that we're not um, that we're talking about today, but it does exclude the ELA, the special populations, and instructional leaders because those standards are covered either previously covered from the previous process or are being covered on a different proposal since they align to different standards. Um, so you can see under middle and secondary, we've got our math, science, social studies, and our uh, for middle grades, and then secondary biology, chemistry, et cetera, um, for all of those uh, nine, or 612 or 912 programs. Our CTE programs um, are specific to the academic areas, um, such as agricultural, agri-science, business education, family and consumer sciences, and marketing. Um, those CTE programs that are occupational will need to align to ECT literacy standards, but those expectations and requirements will be outlined in uh, the proposal review that specific to the occupational CTE. And for those ECTs that have those programs, more information about that is forthcoming. And finally, our pre-K-12 programs uh, include our fine arts, phys ed, world languages and library specialists with some exclusions that you can see noted there in the gray, um, in the gray header bar. So there's language on the top of page two of your guidance document that articulates that the department has determined how the endorsements will be addressed on a single proposal. Um, we want you to follow the guidelines listed um, in the tables below uh, to determine the number of Pro, uh, proposals to complete. So if an EPP offers initial licensure at both the undergraduate and post back level, a combined proposal may be submitted for these programs. So for example, if your EPP offers both middle grade math at the undergraduate level and uh, at the post back program, all of those programs should be addressed on proposal one. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what this means as we get into kind of the meat of the proposal document. But this is sort of those tables that we were talking about here. So you can see all of our math is consolidated onto proposal one, all of our sciences on proposal two, and et cetera for um, all those endorsement areas we, we have um, outlined for you. Uh, within this guidance document, each one of the proposal templates are hyperlinked within, uh, you can see that blue language right there. Um, and so to access that particular proposal template, we ask for you to click on that link and download the applicable um, uh, proposal template to, to complete with your faculty. So let's talk about individual proposal structure. So all of the proposals listed in these tables here, all eight proposals, follow the same structure. There are going to be three parts to each proposal template. Part one is all about the identification of the endorsement. Part two is to show uh, standards alignment through the matrix um, attachment that we've uh, provided. And then part three is addressing those comprehensive questions. To try and give you a sense about how to get your heads wrapped around these expectations, part one and part two are really about the breadth of standard coverage across your program. Part three is going to be a deep dive into the depth of coverage of the standards across selected endorsement areas. And we'll talk, a little, we'll talk more about what that means here um, in the next couple slides. Let me provide for you an example. If your EDP offers um, a middle or secondary um, program within social studies, let's say your, your EPP out of all of the endorsement areas listed, your EPP offers um, econ, geography, and history. What you'll do within part one, which again is the identification of endorsements, is you will simply check the boxes that apply 
for your approved program within the particular endorsement area. So you can see if you offer econ um, at the 612 level, at, I'm sorry, for 612 grade band area at the both undergraduate and post -back level, you'll check both of those boxes. The example provided here shows that that post -back, the EPP would offer the clinical type at the post -back level for both job embedded and student teaching. So again, the purpose for part one is just to identify this proposal is going to be covering the following endorsement areas that are offered at our EPP. You'll also see a check checkbox underneath each one of those endorsement areas, and you'll simply check that box if your EPP offers an approved dual endorsement area. So if you if your EPP offers, say, an econ and a um, math dual endorsement program, then you'll check the box under econ to say that this endorsement is part of, an, uh, of a, a dual endorsement program with mathematics 612, and you'll just write in the other endorsement area um, to show that those dual endorsements are included within this identification process. Um, so part two asks for a standards alignment matrix. And for those of you that have engaged in any of the other endorsement area literacy proposal processes, um, you might remember this standards alignment as more of a table. So um, for this particular process, we've developed a matrix. And so the intent is the same. Again, it's to show the breadth of coverage across your courses and your clinical experiences um, for any and all endorsements covered on this particular proposal. So again, taking this history example, if you are, or social studies example, if you offer at your EPP um, econ, history, and geography, then you will list all of the courses that are offered at your proposals of which are um, going to be embedded with your EPP literacy standards. So um, an example might be, you know, Education 401, um, introductory, introductory to history content. And you'll see alignment um, as you're talking with your faculty that um, standard EPP literacy standards one and two will fit within um, that course. And so you'll list that course under course name and then you'll check the box for standard one and standard two. For any applicable um, clinical types, then you'll list those same um, prefixes and names of those clinical types and then check any um, standards that will be embedded within those clinical experiences. Um, we will transition here and talk about our comprehensive questions shortly. This is just showing an overview. The comprehensive questions are really aligned with our, our first two EPP literacy standards that are more candidate focused. So our first question addresses discipline specific literacy skills and strategies. And the second question is really about academic and discipline specific vocabulary. The third comprehensive question that's required as part of this proposal process is really going to be focused on students, and it talks a bit about the clinical experiences that are designed to support candidates in supporting students um, in this regard. So I'm going to pause here before we switch gears and, and do a deep dive into disciplinary literacy to see if there are any questions that we can address before moving forward. We just had a question about what's intended um, to put on the clinical name. So uh, this question is in reference to that second row. Um, so there's course name on the first row and clinical name on the second row. And all you'll need to put there is um, the, the title of the clinical name. So it could be, you know, educational practice 420, and then it would say early field experience for secondary majors. That's all we mean by um, uh, requiring a clinical name within that alignment matrix table. And I'll add too, the, the matrix can be found within the proposal templates that are individually linked by endorsement areas. So if this looks new, what you'll see in the guidance document is a filled out example, and then the actual blank matrices with the fillable PDF, they are linked per proposal. 
And EPPs are free to use as many matrices as needed, so you can just duplicate that matrix um, to show if you offer if you have an EPP that offers um, many courses that will be um, submitted under this proposal. Feel free to duplicate that matrix as necessary. Okay, um, feel free to continue sending those questions along. Uh, if you can, please direct them to Lindsay Nelson, and we'll be able to either address them here at the webinar or uh, follow up with you afterwards. Let's go ahead and get into, um, you know, the research-based approach of disciplinary literacy. So what we'll provide at the October 29th meeting is a uh, extensive uh, reference list that will have many um, articles and publications that we think might be worth um, digging deep into with your faculty to sort of understand um, this approach to disciplinary literacy across the content areas. Um, if anything, we strongly encourage all EPPs to read the recommended readings posted here on this slide. Um, for those of you that attended the July Literacy Network meeting, you'll see the first two reports uh, are probably familiar as they were uh, distributed at that meeting. Um, we really, again, highly recommend EPPs read them. They're full of really practical information um, that we think can be um, readily embedded within the educator preparation and um, think that they can be really helpful uh, as you begin that drafting piece. The Shanahan and Shanahan article um, provides some additional foundational knowledge about this approach that we think would be really valuable and worth EPPs time to review. And again, we'll um, send out copies of both the PowerPoint as well as the webinar recording um, after, after either at the end of this week, um, but certainly by the EPP update that will be published, I believe, next week. Is that right? Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Um, so if you attended that Literacy Network meeting in July, you saw a little teaser um, that we provided to talk, uh, to begin the conversation about this idea of content area literacy and thinking about it in relation to um, and contrasting with disciplinary literacy. So from the research, we provided these um, two definitions where content area literacy is focused on the ability to use reading and writing to learn the subject matter in a discipline, whereas the disciplinary literacy approach focuses on how reading and writing are used in the discipline being studied. So content area literacy and disciplinary literacy are umbrella terms that describe two different approaches to literacy instruction that are embedded within different subject areas or disciplines. Um, let's take a, a deeper dive into what the research says about disciplinary literacy. Disciplinary literacy recognizes that each discipline possesses its own language. And I think what has been really helpful for me is looking in particular at that third definition uh, about the ability to negotiate and create text in discipline-appropriate ways or in ways that other members of the discipline, mathematicians, historians, artists, would recognize as correct or viable. And why is disciplinary literacy so important? Um, we know that it can support students in becoming members of a disciplinary culture. We know that each discipline has a specialized habit of mind or ways of thinking. It has its own language and vocabulary, um, different texts to comprehend, ways of communicating and writing and speaking, um, as well as uh, um, having its own career requirements. What we also know is that when content area instructors work closely with their literacy instructors in supporting disciplinary literacy understanding, students are able to see more closely the relevance of literacy to their particular discipline and are afforded more time to explore the literacy content connections in greater depth and more substantive and discipline-specific ways. What we know from the research that disciplinary literacy is not it's not another term for content area reading. It's not a method to work with struggling readers. And it's not a generalized approach to literacy across disciplines, nor is it limited to study skills. When we really look at um, content area literacy and disciplinary literacy, they're not mutually exclusive approaches to instruction. 
Um, I think one of the ways that I that really helps for me to, to make these distinctions is to think that content area reading prescribes study techniques um, that can help someone better understand or comprehend text better. Um, you may be familiar with study te techniques such as the SQ3R or the survey question, read, recite, and review approach, um, or be familiar with sort of those generalized reading comprehension strategies like summarizing or retelling or um, predicting. Those are really what we're thinking about when we talk about the uh, study techniques that fall more under the umbrella of content area reading approach. Disciplinary literacy, again, emphasizes the description of unique uses and implications of literacy use within the various disciplines. So let's look at these um, two approaches side by side as we begin to understand the critical task. We know that students will understand text. Um, from a content area literacy approach, they really do this by interpreting text. They can do this by asking clarifying questions or reading headings to make predictions. Um, they might summarize a passage or engage in word analysis strategies. Where in contrast with a disciplinary literacy approach, students will really not just understand text through interpreting, but critique text by, in a history example, corroborating evidence across sources, or in a math example, begin to evaluate and critique solutions. In science, they might take uh, scientific principles um, purposefully to critique uh, advertisements of products having claims of research-based results. Um, when we think about the second critical task that students engage in either composing or revising text under this content area literacy approach, students will brainstorm and organize initial ideas within graphic and visual written formats and they may read aloud their writing for flow and clarity. Under a disciplinary literacy approach, students will analyze good writing across these genres. They also will evaluate and revise text to adhere to the discipline-specific criteria. And we contrast these again to look across these distinctions um, to begin to understand those distinctions, but what we really want to um, drive home the importance of there's really a place for both of these. Um, research supports that, that content area literacy instruction can lead to positive outcomes for diverse students on measurements of content knowledge and literacy achievement. Um, but we know that content area instruction without concurrent emphasis on discipline specific content and practices does not produce optimal results in students' learning. So again, we're really trying to emphasize we really are, are thinking about both of these approaches but really beginning to help EPPs um, to begin shift to understand what is this disciplinary literacy approach. I'm going to pause here and see if there are any other questions before we move on. Okay, we got a couple good questions. Um, one question was, is there a way to see what others are asking via chat since it only kind of shows what you are um, saying and engaging with uh, the panelists? And so we're doing our best to kind of repeat these so that everybody can hear the questions. Uh, I believe we've addressed every question so so far. Um, any questions that we won't address, we'll be sure to at least say that there was that question and then follow up with that person in the group um, as we uh, move forward. We also received another question that asked if program courses and sequences are distinctly different, so like music and art, although they fall under that same proposal structure, would allowances be made for a word count or separate proposals? And we're going to get into that because um, the short answer is we're going to be looking for sort of a sample across these endorsements. Um, but I want to give you some really explicit examples as we move forward, and hopefully that becomes um, more clear um, as we continue. So let's um, really focus on those comprehensive questions. As a reminder, we have three questions that all proposals um, must address, and that we've got the first two really focused on the candidate, um, and uh, the third question really focused on students um, through the design of clinical experiences. Before we jump in, if those of you um, are less familiar with the rubric, um, these rubrics are the ones that will actually be used by reviewers to evaluate your proposal responses 
um, once they are submitted to the department. Um, each question is organized in this fashion where you see um, the question listed above in the header and then we've got the ratings below on either a meet approaching or below expectations. Another bit um, of advice to think through is the idea of this optional attachment. And so um, every uh, question has a word count limit. I believe it's 1,500 words per question. The EPC also has the option to provide attachments that might be used, say, for example, of course, um, syllabus or a um, assessment description that might be used to sort of support the rationale or argument that's being made in the narrative response. So we just encourage you, if you're kind of running out of those word counts, um, to really make good use of the attachment. Um, but we'll talk later of that the narrative response should really drive um, the argument and the rationale to support um, the answer. So we'll kind of get into that in, in a little bit, a uh, little bit later. But this is just an overview of. Um, how to read that rubric, and we really strongly encourage EPPs to think about this criteria carefully as they're drafting their um, responses to the narrative questions. Let's talk a bit about question one, discipline-specific literacy skills and strategies. The question is, um, provide examples of at least two opportunities for candidates to attain and demonstrate a deep understanding of discipline-specific literacy skills and strategies essential to their endorsement area. So um, as we kind of um, begin thinking about that question about discipline-specific skills and strategies, I think first it's important to think about um, the approach that each of these disciplines take and some example practices as we sort of narrow down to focus on those skills and strategies. So if you look at an example for math, we know that mathematicians read carefully, they evaluate the meaning of each word or symbol and apply logic to their reading. So some of these example practices that mathematicians engage with are learning accurate definitions, they might be rereading, um, they're reading equations with appropriate directionality, but really focus on detecting those errors of um, sort of this black and white, what's right and wrong. Um, when we look at the approach that scientists take, they'll read information depicted in different forms that's often transformed from prose to more figures and diagrams, equations, photographs, et cetera. Um, text features of scientific text often um, have uh, long noun phrases. They might um, partake in nominalization of verbs. Um, all of those features are often present in those science texts. Example practices scientists take is that they explain information using several representations. They might hedge their findings and say, you know, based on what we know or what the research has gathered about this particular topic, we have some limitations that we want to express um, based on the outcomes of this research. So hedging findings is really another example practice scientists um, take. And of course, um, scientists will um, write for different audiences and purposes. We look at two other approaches um, to discipline in history. Historians can consider multiple perspectives when reading and writing historical accounts and arguments. The practices in which they'll take is that they'll provide attention to source and, and context. They'll really analyze uh, accounts that present conflicting interpretations and then use language of causality and chronology. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, in physical education, individuals are more inclined to use perceptive, empathetic, nonverbal communication. The practices in which they gauge are more of a preponderance of listening and speaking skills, and they may map their representations against explanations and so again, as we kind of think about, this is not an, um, not an all-encompassing list. Of course, there's other disciplines we haven't touched on. But this is just meant to show some of these examples of the approaches that these um, individuals within these disciplines take and some of the practices in which they engage. So as we start thinking about um, these uh, disciplinary practices, um, I really sort of challenge you all to think about how do they translate to discipline-specific literacy skills and strategies that they can use with their, their students. Uh, we want to provide an example here, and this is going to be an example that EPPs might use to support a narrative response to question one. 
So if we put our historian hats on, we think about the ways that historians um, begin to think about reading the body of text, um, they really um, focus on perspective. They'll consider who the audience was, the source, um, where and when it was written, which is the context, and what the purpose was and for whom it was written. So the acronym here in this example is the Soapstone um, Strand, which stands for Speaker Occasion, Audience, Purpose, Subject, and Tone. And so historians really start to consider thinking about the first five of these even before they begin reading. Um, and again, this is a really practical strategy that we can teach to both um, candidates and students um, uh, that might be included as something um, that would be uh, responsive to part, narrative um, part of question one. So, and again, that's an opportunity that are provided um, to candidates to attain and demonstrate a deep understanding of discipline specific literacy skills and strategies. So if we think about the Soapstone um, activity and we think about it in relation to the rubric expectations, we see that in order to meet expectations, candidates are provided two or more substantial opportunities to obtain knowledge of disciplinary literacy as it relates to the endorsement areas. Now I want to pause here and, and, and reiterate the importance of um, what, were, what the expectations are for comprehensive questions. What, this, what we're requiring here is that even if your EPP offers history, geography, government, many of the endorsements listed under the social studies, we're only looking for two opportunities. They might both be in history. Um, so we're just looking for a sample of what this looks like in at least one of the endorsements that's listed. So um, in terms of addressing every single endorsement that falls under that proposal category, that's not what we're asking for here. We really want to stress the importance that we're looking for a deep dive on um, disciplinary literacy within a couple um, endorsement areas. Um, as we look again um, at the rubric criteria here, you can see that the soapstone activity may be um, an example of how um, beginning to make the shift from some of those more generalizable skills and strategies to more discipline specific. Um, if we're looking for um, a way to demonstrate that this response is more focused on how reading and writing are used in this discipline, then an example response within the narrative might also include how this soapstone is not just um, to trigger a mere identification process, but it's really a strategy that will support students and candidates in, in creating schema that they need so that they understand how this approach can become a regular approach to critiquing text as a historian. I'm going to pause here and just see if there are any other questions before we proceed to question two. So I just want to reiterate here that the expectation for all three of these questions is that we have a sample of what this looks like in um, one, um, one or more endorsement areas if the, if the question dictates. We'll see on question two that it says if there's more than two, um, uh, if there's more than one endorsement listed within that proposal, we'll uh, require an example from at least two different endorsements. But I just want to stress that this is really about a sample of um, literacy skills and strategies and shortly here talking about academic and discipline specific vocabulary within um, one to two endorsement areas. So some of those questions about, you know, if the programs are drastically different. Again, we want breadth of coverage in when you identify the endorsements covered on these proposals. And we also want to see that represented on your standards matrix. But in terms of responding and meeting expectations for these comprehensive questions, it's just a sample of endorsement areas. So let's transition and talk a little bit about academic and discipline-specific vocabulary. Again, um, the question asks provide at least two examples of opportunities. And the footnote was if two or more endorsements are addressed on this proposal, examples must be from two different endorsement areas. So this might mean a history and a geography example. Um, for both candidates to acquire 
academic and disciplinary um, specific vocabulary and communicate this vocabulary, vocabulary accurately and um, effectively. So what we know from the research is that um, vocabulary sort of uh, fits within these tiers. And so our focus is really on tier two with academic vocabulary and tier three discipline specific vocabulary. Um, Academic vocabulary is really those high-frequency words that are found in academic texts across a variety of domains, but unlikely to occur in everyday speech. Whereas those tier three vocabulary words um, are those low-frequency words specific to a particular field of study, often found in those informational texts about that subject. Um, just as what we mentioned earlier in the webinar, what is good practice is to really have that collaboration among the content area instructors with the, with the literacy instructors um, to really determine what, you know, what are these um, tier two and tier three vocabulary words that are essential for our candidates to be learning. So um, we're not really seeing this disciplinary literacy approach living in any particular area of educator preparation, and we're going to talk much more about this at the October 29th meeting, but really we, we really want to stress about the importance of collaboration between the content area folks with our literacy folks to understand what's best for candidates as they are supporting our, our students in this regard. So let's look at these two different approaches to acquiring uh, vocabulary. Within a content area approach, um, these approach, this approach does not adequately recognize the discipline-specific distinctions in vocabulary, um, and the discipline area approach um, really does highlight those discipline-specific distinctions. Um, if you think about content area approach uh, to learning vocabulary, these are generally what we talk about in terms of the study skills, um, regardless of terminology, where we might um, interact with our candidates and students using um, graphic organizers or semantic mapping or flashcards, um, where the disciplinary approach to learning vocabulary is, again, more centered on what is required within the discipline. So we provided two examples for you up here. Um, for science, we think about the analysis of, of Greek and Latin derivatives for the purpose of understanding science concepts within this particular discipline. And so we provide an example up there about biology. And so when I read this example first, I started thinking about that word biology. And I knew um, from my more generalizable study skills from a more content area approach that biology is the study of life. Um, ology means study of, bio is life. Um, but, and so that's really what we think about when we think about the content area approach. And when you're thinking about the discipline of science here, there's an example when we think about biology of herbivore, carnivore, and omnivore. And when you look at that suffix vor, what we know is that um, comes from the Latin suffix of voris, which means to devour. So when you start thinking about these terms um, together, you begin to understand if we're teaching about herbivore, carnivore, and omnivore, we begin thinking about this whole idea of what they are consuming. And this lends itself well to thinking about larger concepts such as food webs or food change chains that are all part of um, the larger ecology that's really important for our, for our students to be learning about. So uh, different approach, similar but different approaches as we look um, across these two. And again, I really want to stress that both are important. Um, students and candidates need both, um, but we really are trying to, again, stress the differences within this disciplinary approach as we notice maybe um, a little bit newer for some of our EPTs. Second example we have here is that uh, within history, just in contrast with science, um, where history um, historians tend to take more metaphorical terms used to unify groups or events to express a particular perspective on an event or an action, such as the Dark Ages or Middle Ages. So um, as we be begin thinking about the rubric expectations, again, we want um, EPPs to provide two or more substantial opportunities and to really think about how um, these opportunities um, candidates can acquire and demonstrate. And so 
when we um, use that word demonstrate um, to think about question number two, um, that can be done in a clinical experience, that can be done with candidate peers or mentor teachers within courses, a um, lot of ways for candidates to sort of practice um, uh, the communication piece of these uh, academic and discipline specific vocabulary. Um, so let's transition and talk a bit about question three. Um, again, we're shifting here from thinking about the candidate focus with questions one and two to more of that student focus, um, K-12 student focus um, here on question three. And so the question asks to describe how clinical experiences are structured to support candidates' ability to prepare K-12 students to acquire, comprehend, and communicate information through reading, writing, um, et cetera. And so to provide some guidance in order to meet expectations uh, for question three, we really think that strong responses will begin to do, uh, will describe the design of clinical experiences. Um, and I know that within the rubric language, we talk a little bit about within an earlier clinical experience and within a later clinical experience, and we'll talk about that here shortly. So again, within this response, we really want to be thinking about the design of the clinical experience to support students. Uh, again, we begin to shift away from the candidate to, um, to the student-focused um, instruction by the candidate. And we also think that strong responses will include opportunities for practice that may have been described in responses to question one and two. So as we look, about, look at that, um, the rubric expectations, again, it's stated within an earlier and then within a later. And I want to just provide some clarification here. When we use the term clinical experience, we, use, we mean that to mean all-encompassing. It's not just limited to student teaching. Um, within, to respond to this question, if the only um, experience that's offered for candidates is the student teaching experience, then that, that clinical experience can be articulated here by talking about earlier within the student teaching experience, candidates will, et cetera, and then later on in that student teaching experience, candidates will, et cetera. You could also respond to this question if the candidates engage in an um, a early field experience before student teaching, um, the responses can really articulate um, the differences between those clinical experiences as well. I'm going to pause here and just see if there are any other questions I can address before moving forward. Okay, we've got a good question about uh, whether the clinical experiences early in the pro um, program are more general than content specific. Um, I would just uh, recommend to think about whether or not that's the right clinical experience to include. Um, it always has the option to, uh, if it's too general and it's not supporting sort of what we're looking for here in terms of um, the expectations on the rubric, you may want to focus on uh, a later clinical experience, but looking at it sort of um, in part one of that later experience for the earlier experience and then later in that second experience to address part B of the um, rubric expectations. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and transition and talk a little bit about some more generalizable um, advice and um, some thoughts we have to support EPPs as they approach this drafting um, of the proposal responses um, more broadly. Um, we really encourage, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, that the narrative responses, that means the 1,500 words, should present the primary argument and evidence to answer the question, to address the requirements, and to incorporate the uh, rubric criteria. And that attachment should really be used to support that narrative response. Reviewers will be trained in that same regard. They'll be trained to look first um, for um, EPPs to address um, what, what the requirements are first in that narrative response and then look to those attachments for additional detail or um, more support um, to sort of clarify what those narrative responses um, had begun. So, um, really, again, the focus should be on those narrative responses. We really encourage you to write for an audience external to your EPPs. All reviewers will be um, 
education folks. So it'll be a combination of both LEA and EPP um, uh, folks. And but they may not know the ins and outs of your EPPs. So we really encourage you to um, think about that as you're writing to make sure, um, for clarity's sake, that um, anybody could kind of pick this up and with an education background be able to read and respond. Um, we also think it's important, again, to use that actual language from the rubric when responding to questions. And um, just as we mentioned that questions one and two responses might be helpful in supporting your response to question three, um, these reviews will be done holistically. That means that the reviewer will, will read all three of those comprehensive questions in its entirety. So it's fine and uh, really helpful, in fact, to reference other responses um, from, say, question one to question three. Um, attachments and word count limits will apply, and we ask um, EPPs to be respectful of that to avoid um, reviewer fatigue. We'll talk a little bit about the review process. Each proposal will be reviewed three times by externally um, external reviewers who will um, be trained to understand the rubric and um, use it to provide feedback. Um, as I mentioned, all each reviewer will read the entire proposal and um, uh, use that rubric criteria to provide a rating for each question. We uh, really encourage EPPs to think about um, uh, removing all identifiable information as they're drafting, meaning to avoid using EPP names or email addresses or any information that would um, that would identify uh, the EPP. This is um, going to be a double uh, blind review process, so any help that we can get to remove that identifiable information from the get-go, um, we really encourage. In terms of the submission process, um, we'll talk more about this in detail at our October 29th meeting. We'll also have a guidance document to support EPPs in um, the actual submission. We use um, the Dropbox file sharing service, to, um, uh, which is free, and will be um, accounts will be set up and literacy leads will be emailed so that um, all proposals, once finalized by the EPP, can be submitted to the department um, based on our timeline as described earlier. Um, again, some, some general advice to adhere to the narrative word counts, to follow the attachment limitations and the naming conventions, which, again, you'll receive information about that at a later date, and to ensure the redaction of all identifiable information. Um, one thing I don't think that we mentioned today was to ensure that everything that you're submitting or all the proposal templates are actually the ones that um, have been supplied by the department. So please download those templates from the guidance document. And if you do include any attachments to save those files as PDFs and include those um, within your Dropbox folders as well. Um, next step, we've already opened our registration for our literacy network meeting. We've invited all EPPs to, in, um, to have up to three um, faculty members attend. Um, this will be a literacy network meeting that covers more than just the non-ELA, middle, secondary, CTE, and pre-K-12 programs, but also invites um, those who will be drafting the ELA, middle, secondary, and instructional leader proposal. And so um, this opportunity will be, um, we really encourage all EPPs to attend. There'll be uh, a chance for us to um, provide examples to narrative responses and sort of work through those with EPPs using the rubric criteria to get even down, uh, further down to a, a deep dive into what these expectations are. There will also be ample time for you to be working with your colleagues to begin or continue drafting your proposal responses, as well as network with other EPP faculty members from across the state. Um, with that, we are going to conclude our webinar today. Um, we encourage you to ask a lot of really good questions at the webinar. Uh, during the webinar, but if you have any moving forward, you um, please feel um, free to email either myself or Lindsay, and we're happy to address um, these questions. We know this is a lot. Um, we know that you're engaging with your colleagues 
maybe that are not even inside the College of Education, but across campus. And it is a heavy lift, and there's a lot of moving parts, and we, we understand that, and we're um, here to support and just, again, encourage any of those questions um, for us to um, uh, respond to. Uh, as, a, as a final note, and then we'll, we'll stay on the line here to see if there are any final questions. We are recording this webinar, and all webinars will be available. Um, uh, the recordings and the PowerPoints will be available. We will publish uh, this information in the next EPP update, which will be released in about two weeks, um, just uh, before our October 29th uh, Literacy Network meeting. We really thank you for attending today and look forward to seeing many of you at the October 29th Literacy Network.